Hi everyone, welcome back to Z Physics. Today we are going to be revising astrophysics and cosmology. In this revision video, I'm going to be following the OCR Physics A specification. However, the physics behind it is applicable to all exam boards. Okay, well, let's get started with astrophysics and in particular with stars. So let's start off with star formation. A star is formed when an interstellar dust cloud collapses under the force of gravity. The gravitational potential energy will be decreasing and thus the kinetic energy will be increasing and hence the temperature as well. Once the temperature reaches a whopping 10 million Kelvin, hydrogen nuclei are going to fuse into helium. At that point, the radiation pressure and the gas pressure equal the force of gravity, which is represented by this diagram over here. And we have a star which is born. A star similar to that of the sun, by similar I mean of a similar mass to the sun, after it runs out of its fuel, it's going to turn into a red giant and then it will turn into a white dwarf and it may have a planetary nebula. A planetary nebula has nothing to do with planets, by the way. It is just some of the remaining matter that's been left over from the death of the red giant. Now, let's revise what happens to larger stars. The evolution of a massive star is different. When the star runs out of its hydrogen fuel, it will turn into a super red giant, which is shown here. When the super red giant doesn't have uh, any more fuel left, this, it ends up in a gigantic supernova explosion. Depending on the initial mass of the star, the um, final outcome will either be a neutron star if the original star is a little bit lighter or a black hole if the star is heavier still. Both of these objects are very, very dense and a black hole will actually have infinite density. A way of categorizing all of the stars is provided by the hirschsprung russell diagram which is presented over here. On the y-axis we have luminosity which is the total power radiated by the star. On the x-axis we have temperature. In a hirschsprung russell diagram the temperature increases to the left. So this is really really important. So for instance, blue supergiants are further on the left compared to red supergiants. Therefore, blue supergiants have the higher temperature. Additionally, we need to be able to remember and identify the different features of this graph. The main diagonal is the main sequence. This is where the star will spend the vast majority of its life cycle. When it runs out of fuel, it will either turn into a red supergiant or a blue supergiant. And um, eventually, depending whether that's possible, it may turn into a white dwarf. White dwarfs are presented by this lower left-hand region of the Hirschsprung Russell diagram. Now, what actually determines whether a star is going to turn into a white dwarf or not? Let's revise the Chandrasekhar limit. This here is a really important definition. The Chandrasekhar limit is the maximum mass of a white dwarf star, and that is 1.4 solar masses. If the Chandrasekhar limit is exceeded, we'll get different objects, for instance, a neutron star. Now that we have finished with stars, what I would like to revise next is EM radiation from stars. The first aspect that we need to revise is the fact that electrons can occupy different energy levels within the, uh, the, uh, the atom and uh, only certain energy levels are allowed. So in the case of hydrogen, for instance, these are the first energy levels and the, the electron can only occupy those specific energies and none of the energies in between. 
the most negative state is known as the ground state, like so. So this is the ground state. And if we keep inputting energy into an electron, it will go up in energy levels until eventually it reaches zero and the electron is ionized. In other words, it escapes the atom. It's also really important to say that energy levels have negative values because energy needs to be inputted into the system to remove electrons. As I said, once an electron is removed, it will have zero energy. Something which is super important, please always check your units and see whether you need to convert from EV to joules. For instance, if you want to calculate anything from this graph, later on, in order to get an answer into SI units, you will need to convert from electron volts to joules. The conversion factor is multiplying by 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus 19, which is the electron charge. Because of conservation of energy, if an electron jumps up an energy level, for instance, if, we, if it went from energy level 1, the ground state, to energy level 2, right over here, this means that a photon must have been absorbed. On the other hand, if a photon on the other hand, if an electron goes down in energy level, for instance, from n is equal to 3 to the ground state, this means that a photon must have been emitted due to energy conservation. Let's focus on the first transition in which the photon was absorbed. Let's call this one transition 1, for instance, and just over here, we are going to do some calculations. So for transition one, the difference in energy from minus 13.6 to 3.4 electron volts is equal to 10.2 EV. We could use that to calculate the frequency of the photon that was absorbed simply by setting this energy delta E equal to the energy of a photon, which is equal to HF. We could just rearrange for the frequency and we can get that the frequency is equal to the change of energy divided by Planck's constant. It would be very, very important to convert the energy from EV to joules. So this will be equal to 10.2 electron volts. So converting to joules, we'll need to multiply this by the elementary charge like so and then we're going to divide by Planck's constant which is 6.63 times 10 to the power of minus 34 giving us 2.46 times 10 to the power of 15 Hertz so let's write this down over here 2.46 times 10 to the power of 15 Hertz we could also focus on this second transition, the one here in blue, in which a photon was emitted. For instance, we could try and calculate the wavelength this time of the emitted photon. The way we're going to do this, first off, we need to find our difference in energy. So 30.6 take away one and a half is going to give us 12.1. Well, it's a little bit too big. Let's try again. It's going to give us 12.1 EV. Now we can set this change of energy equal to HC over lambda and all we need to do really is just rearrange for the wavelength. The wavelength will be equal to HC divided by the difference in energy giving us H which is 6.63 times 10 to the power of minus 34 times the speed of light which is 3.0 times 10 to the power of 8 divide that by delta E which is 12.1 remember we need to convert that to joules so multiplying by the elementary charge which is 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus 19 and if we put that into a scientific calculator giving us 1.03 multiplied by 10 to the power of minus 7 meters in general with those problems we always set the change of energy 
equal to the energy of a photon, leading us to well, leading to those two equations which we've just used. The first one is that delta E is equal to HF. If we're looking for the wavelength or if we're given the wavelength and we need to calculate something else, delta E is equal to HC divided by lambda. Talking about the energy levels and the transitions between them, we need to mention the continuous and absorption spectrums. Well, first off, let's start with the emission spectrum. This is caused when a hot gas emits photons. Because only certain energy levels are allowed, such as in this diagram, you can only go, let's say, from here to here, from here to here, or from there to there, only certain wavelengths can also be emitted. So, therefore, if we heat up a hot gas, we're only going to see certain wavelengths, for instance, this one, this one, and this one, and no other ones. Therefore, the emission spectrum looks the way it does with colored vertical lines on a dark black background. Different atoms can have different spectral lines, and we can use those to identify them. So, for instance, helium's spectrum is going to look different from hydrogen's, etc., and uh, we'll be able to identify them. We can also have an absorption spectrum, which is caused when a hot gas absorbs photons. For instance, in the solar corona, the uh, solar atmosphere will be able to absorb some of the photons that are being emitted from near the core of the sun because only certain frequencies or wavelengths can be absorbed then this they will correspond to those dark lines therefore the absorption spectrum looks like such it is dark black lines on a continuous spectrum background. Colloquially, continuous spectrum will compose of all the different wavelengths, so it looks similar in the visible range as a rainbow. One way to find the wavelength of an incoming light in order to analyze it is via a diffraction grating. Remember, diffraction is the spreading of light as it passes through a gap or around an obstacle. A diffraction grating is going to have multiple different slits uh, along all around its surface, and once the light passes through, it is going to spread, resulting in a diffraction pattern which will be seen on the screen. The equation which governs this is that d sine of the angle theta is equal to n times lambda. Let's analyze this equation. d in this equation is 1 over the number of lines per meter. And this is really, really important. For instance, let's say that this diffraction grading had 300 lines per millimeter, this would mean that it will have 300 times 10 to the 3 lines per meter. In other words, D really is the spacing between the individual lines. So 1 over N is in this case going to be 1 over 300 times 10 to the power of 3. Theta is the angle that corresponds to the order of the diffraction. For instance, if we're interested in the position of this particular fringe, our theta is going to be this one over here. Let's give it a number. Let's say that this one here is 25 degrees. We're going to use that in an equation in, in a minute. So this is the angle theta, and as I said, is the order of diffraction. It doesn't really matter whether we choose this side or this side, because this angle here will be the same as the other angle. And lambda is the wavelength. We could use that to find the wavelength of the particular light. So let's do that for the values given for the first order of diffraction. So 1 over n will be equal to 1 over 300 times 10 to the power of 3, like so, multiplied by the sine of 25 degrees. That's going to equal to the first order, so n is equal to 1 times the wavelength.
all we need to do really is just put that into a calculator and I'll be able to find the wavelength of that particular light. So lambda will be 1 over 300 times 10 to the power of 3 times the sine of 25 degrees. And if we put that into a calculator, we are going to get 1.4 multiplied by 10 to the power of minus 6 meters. We could use a diffraction grading for an experiment to determine the wavelength of the light that has gone through the diffraction grading. In practice as well, this could be used to determine what wavelengths are within the light that is incoming in telescopes from stars. Let's have a look at that experiment. So we're going to need to take certain measurements. With a ruler, we're going to measure the distance to the screen D and then the, distance, the distances from the central maximum to the individual fringes. In practice, this is, good. This is going to be x1 for this distance over here and it's going to be x2 from the distance from the point n is equal to 2 to the central maximum. As always, we're going to take multiple measurements and we're going to average them each time to improve the accuracy. In terms of the analysis, we can calculate the corresponding angle using the fact that theta is going to be the inverse tan of x divided by d, where the distance x will correspond to the distance of the individual fringe to the central maximum. Why is that so? Let me just explain maybe a little bit uh, better. In general, tan of theta will be opposite over adjacent, which is going to be x over d. So that means that theta will be inverse tan of x over d, like so. Once we have our angle theta, then we can also we can cal we'll need to calculate d, the line spacing, using 1 over n, where n is the number of lines per meter. Normally, we can get the number of lines per millimeter from the actual diffraction grading. It will normally say it on the diffraction grading itself, and that will be 300 lines per millimeter in this case, for instance, or 300 times 10 to the power of 3 lines per, uh, per meter. And this over here is our n, so n is equal to that. So once we have our angles, so let's say we've calculated, we have essentially a table of x, d, and the angle of theta. Let's say we've calculated three or four, or hopefully as many as we possibly can. We can plot a graph of n, the order of diffraction, against sine of theta. Performing y equals mx plus c analysis, remember d sine theta is equal to n lambda, we just need to rearrange for whatever is on the y-axis, and if we plot n on the y-axis, sine of theta on the x-axis, our gradient is going to be d over lambda. The graph should be a straight line through the origin with a gradient of d over lambda. Just simply rearranging for lambda, we get that lambda, the wavelength, will be equal to d, the line spacing, divided by m, the gradient. We can use that to estimate its temperature, and once we have its temperature, we could even estimate its luminosity, or if we have the luminosity, we could estimate the radius of a star. Let's start off by revising Wien's displacement law. This says that the predominant wavelength that's been emitted, lambda max, is inversely proportional to the temperature of the star. In practice, this means that stars with longer wavelengths, for instance red giants, are not going to be as hot, and stars with shorter wavelengths, for instance blue giants, are going to be quite hot. They're going to have a very high temperature. Mathematically, we could always write this statement as lambda max is equal to a constant, let's call that k, divided by t. The value of this constant will either be given in the question or you need to be able to calculate it. My favorite trick for this is simply just to say that lambda max times the temperature is equal to a constant, where k is some constant. So we could always just write this down as lambda max 1 times t1 is equal to lambda max 2 
multiplied by T2. Now, moving on to Stefan's law, once we have the temperature, we could figure out really easily, let's say, the radius of the star. Uh, just a couple of words about Stefan's law first off. L over here is the luminosity of the star. So luminosity of the star. Essentially, this is power. So this is measured in watts. It's the total power that's been radiated outwards from the star. 4 pi r squared, this is just the surface area of a sphere. This over here is the radius of the star, like so. And T is the surface temperature, like so. Quite a common mistake would be to forget to raise this to a power of 4 or maybe square it. But this is one of the few laws which is nonlinear and um, you can see that it's been raised to the power of 4. Um, okay, cool. Now let's quickly rearrange for r squared. For instance, if we wanted to figure out the radius of the star, r squared will be equal to the luminosity divided by 4 pi times Stefan Boltzmann's constant, which is given in your formula booklet, multiplied by t to the power of 4, which means that the radius of the star will be given by the square root of L divided by 4 pi times Stefan's constant times t to the power of 4. So quite a typical question would be to be given some data from which you would need to estimate the temperature of a, of a star. Let's call that T2. Normally you're given one, um, one set of data, lambda max 1, T1, then you need to figure out T2. And then once you have the temperature, you can use this equation to estimate the radius. Let's apply those two laws via uh, an example. We have the fact that the peak wavelength emitted by the sun is about 550 nanometers with a surface temperature of about 6000 Kelvin. Calculate the surface temperature of another star with a peak wavelength of 400 nanometers. So in our formula booklet, we know that lambda max is proportional to 1 over the temperature. And as we've written down over here, we can always just say that lambda max 1 times T1 is equal to lambda max 2 multiplied by T2. For the sun, we know that the peak wavelength is 550 nanometers times the temperature which is 6000 kelvin this will equal to lambda max 2 which is 400 nanometers times t2 notice that i didn't convert the nanometers to meters because they would have just cancelled out on both sides of the equation we could just simply rearrange for t2 which is going to be 550 times 6000 divided by 400 and if we put that into a calculator, we are going to get 8,250 degrees. So let's just write this down, 8,250 degrees. This problem will work up to, let's say, two significant figures because this is given up to 550. So I'm going to leave that as 8,300 degrees Kelvin. And if we do that, we are going to get about... 1.2 multiplied by 10 to the power of 9 meters for the radius of this star. Okay, folks, so this was pretty much the entire spec on astrophysics. Join us for our next video in which we are going to be going through the cosmology bit, the remainder of Unit 5 from OCR Physics A. Hopefully this was useful, guys. If there are any questions about the problems, do drop a comment and please consider subscribing. Thank you very much.